the McNugget Buddies are back. But this time, they got a fresh look as part of the new Kerwin Frost Box at McDonald's. We're talking all new buddies, dressed head to toe in the freshest fits, all designed by the artist Kerwin Frost. So when you order the Kerwin Frost Box with your choice of 10-piece McNuggets or a Big Mac, you'll get one of the flyest McNugget Buddies to go with it. Think you can collect them all? Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. I'm loving it. At participating McDonald's for a limited time, while supplies last. This episode contains conversations about disordered eating. As always, there's lots of hope and humor in the talk, but please listen at your discretion. Edit audio. The first time that I remember feeling overweight, I was like eight years old. Now, back then, you had to visit the school nurse for a physical before the school year started. And it wasn't some doctor's office appointment where you, you know, flip through highlight magazines waiting your turn. No, it was this long, winding snake of a line through the hallways of the school filled with tweens waiting to get their heart listened to before stepping on a scale. There was no privacy. There was no HIPAA protecting my tender little heart. There was just me and my boy's corduroy pants standing on a scale in front of all of my friends. And I remember, I remember watching the numbers. I remember Mike Rouse clocking in in the 50s and Matt, whatever his last name was, in the 60s. And and then I got on the scale. Eight years old, weighing in in the 80s. And I, I couldn't deny the lovely symmetry of the numbers 8, 80. I loved that. But I also couldn't deny that I was 25% heavier than all my friends. I could just feel the shame rattling around the inside of my chest as I stepped off the scale. No one said anything mean that I can recall. And, you know, if I if I look back at the pics today, I, I was not overweight. But I just knew in the depths of my soul that I felt fat. And I knew for me... This was not okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Robin Hopkins, and this is Well Adjusting, where I talk to people about life stuff, but not in an NPR way. It's more like we're at the bar, having cocktails, getting into your business sort of way. It's it's giving drunk NPR. Oh, and producer Steph is here, too. Hello. Today we chat, well, handing down body image issues. Hello, everyone. Uh, This is a topic that is just near and dear to my heart. And I have to be honest, not necessarily in a fun way, but it is something that has taken up a very big part of my life. We're talking about weight, gaining it, losing it, obsessing about it. And today, a lovely woman named Kate joins us, and she's going to talk about how her body image was shaped by her parents and and their parents and how she wants to be the one to break the cycle for her two daughters. So put down the Dex trim and let's hear what Kate has to say. How do I not screw up my daughters? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> period no how do, um how do i avoid passing on body image issues to two girls mm. i think it's one of those things where you didn't realize quite how fucked up you were until you got older <laughs> and like i think you think no everybody is this fucked up right yeah and then to some degree sure but i think growing up it wasn't until I was like eight or nine that I realized I didn't like who I was or like mm. I didn't like what I looked like. And then as I got older, there was just like a lot of other people reminding me of that. Yeah. Right. Like family members or. Yeah. So like my grandfather would say something. Oh, you better watch out or you're going to get fat like your aunt. So and so. That's so nice to say to an eight year old. Right. And it was like, don't eat that kid. You got to get fat. And of course, like his wife, like historically had lots of issues with eating disorders yeah. and um, wonder why. And then as you get older, you kind of just start to internalize those things. Mm-hmm. And I think I was like 18. And I remember I was in college and 
I like accidentally saw myself in a mirror, like oh, in a bathroom mirror. That's the worst when you're not ready for right, it. And I, and you're I not ready for avoiding it. mirrors, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, like a vampire. Do not. <laughs> I cannot be seen. They will steal my soul. Yeah. And I was like, oh man, I hate that person. I really hate the way she looks. She's fat and ugly. And and then I just started crying oh. on the bath, like the public bathroom floor. Oh, because I think I realized, like, I had gone through a moment in high school where I just stopped eating and loved the way I looked, sure, right? Sure, I was so skinny. I was never able to do that, by the way. I was like, my friend and I in college used to call each other the forgetful bulimics. We were like, <laughs> you binged, but yeah, you never purged. Yeah. We were like, it's fine, I'll get to that later. <laughs> Should we get ice cream? <laughs> yeah. So I, like, I had this moment where I liked the way I look, probably like two years. And then I got to college, and I remember this moment where I started sobbing on some public bathroom floor, which is dirty and gross, but also just like realizing in that moment that it wasn't a phase that I wasn't going to like myself yeah. forever. Yep. I, re- I was like, this is, I'm stuck. Yeah. Like this is, a- this is forever. And like somehow also knew like no matter what I did, I was not going to like myself. Right. So I think at that point it became so much like, okay, so this is Kate. Kate is constantly striving to, be thinner, look different, have a smaller nose, change her hair, do something that'll make her happy. And she simultaneously knows it'll never happen. Yeah, it'll never work. Right. But like you keep doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think that is where I got to a point like at 18 where I said, okay, that's just who I am. Like and it became my personality. The part you were saying, this is who I am as in, forgive me, like I'm fucked up. You weren't yeah. saying this is who I am. I love my body. No, you were no, saying no. like this is like you were embracing like I, I hate myself and this is who I am. Right. And okay. then you start making jokes about it and it that yeah, it make really, the joke before someone else makes it. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it was gonna be like I was gonna be funny about yep. it. Yep. And I was not getting out of it. Yeah. And that served me fairly well for the next like, I don't know, fifteen years or so. Yeah. Um and then I had kids. Yeah. And I saw once my girls were probably like three and six and four and seven, that my mom had like tried to break oh, the cycle. Interesting. So it is a generational thing. It's not just your aunt. It's your mom too. Oh, yeah. So it's like, you know, everybody in our family has had weight issues, men and women. Um, and then my grandmother throughout my entire life and her sisters were all the kinds of people who talked about eating. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> they all had really big families. So like seven and eight children. So they cooked these humongous meals. Yeah. Well, that was a way of showing love, like especially yeah. during times when things were lean and. Totally. And they're like depression era mm-hmm. women, right? So they liked these huge meat and potato dinners. Um, but I never saw them eat any of it. Oh, that's interesting. So they'd like make all these meals for people and then be like, oh, I was picking the whole time. I'm not hungry. Right. Um. And so my grandmother was like 90 pounds my whole life. And I think that was hard for her kids to probably not see themselves in her. Like, I think they they weren't 90 pounds, right? Like my aunts and my mom are definitely not uber petite people. Um, But I think when I started talking to my girls about like, quote unquote, healthier eating, I Mm. hate like saying that, right? Or, you know, why we choose to have a nutritious snack instead of a Twinkie. It was then that I kind of saw that like my mom had tried to talk about things differently maybe. Right. And yet that like wasn't enough. I still turned out fucked up. Well, okay. Let's slow down for just a second. Okay. Yeah. Like I want to, I do want to talk about your kids. Cause I do think that there is a piece about like how we model and what we do, but I, I, I really think most of it lives over here in Kate. Okay. And so like, I'm curious, um, Like, you became successful in a career path. You got married. Like, so you were able to do, like, you were able to find self-esteem enough to attract a person, be with a person, show up as yourself. Like, did you do any work? And what happened in there before you had kids? Yeah. So I've definitely, I've been in therapy on and off since I was 16. Shout Um, out. (laughs) I'm not sure I ever used it in a way that, like, was particularly effective. Mm -hmm. But... I found other things to feed my self-esteem. I wouldn't say they're particularly healthy things, but like... Well, yes, work. Work, right. Value in what I like produce. Fr- like, yeah, friends, accomplishments. Who likes like, me. Yeah. Um, and if they like me, then I like get to be a, a more... It like increases my value. Sure. 
um, to myself and others. So you've like <laughs> you've like strategized this in a way. You've like compartmentalized the shit out of this. Oh, like yeah. you just put it over here and like glossed up other areas, and then you were able to like walk through it. Yeah, I think you or I. There you I go. Just have a there host. You go. Every therapist says that. We are we're all. Everyone was like nodding. Yep. Yeah. I <laughs> statement. Right. I think I. Um, once I knew it wasn't going to change, like the way I thought about myself and if I liked myself, I was like, I'm never going to be body positive. I'm never going to be someone who likes herself. But if if I can gain like currency in other ways, mm. then I've made up the difference somehow. Right. God, you made it into like a business exchange. I've never heard this. It's genius. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think like I think I feel like we need to take a moment to just talk about how <laughs> smart we are like around oh, trauma, yeah. like what we're able to do to survive, what we're able to, you know, you created and devised a very unique system to survive and to still have the trauma at the same right. time. It's like good and bad. Yeah. I think it was, it actually would have been fine if I didn't have kids, right? Because it like, it got me through life fine. Sure. And it still does. It's yeah. not like I'm crippled by anxiety every time I walk out of the house, although sometimes that happens too. Um, when you are then in charge of someone or two someones who are thinking those thoughts, if you are not dealing with the thing, the trauma that you put away, it's not it eases, I feel like I'm lying. All it comes the time. out your pores. It comes out your pores, right? But I'm like lying. Like I'm yeah. saying things that I very much don't believe about myself. Oh God. Just so that I can like say the right thing. Well, this is what I'm curious about because it sounds like we have very similar, like very, very similar issues in, in this, except I didn't come up with that fancy system you did, which I am kudos. You're welcome. I know. Way to <laughs> way to disguise that trauma. Um, but like when my kids were born, I was like, I have to be perfect. Like, mm. I, and I made, I had this whole thing of like, I cannot break them because I was broken. So I was like, we have to be better. We have to be superhuman. They have to eat wheatgrass. But there was like a realization at some point that that is just like, they start growing up and they start getting older. And I didn't account for this. <laughs> they're watching you and they're smart and they see. So if you're telling them to wash their face at night and you don't, they're picking up on it. Yeah. So I think a lot of people would come at this as just like talking about parenting plans and like our healthy eating. And I don't. I don't, I don't think it's that at all. I think it's it all lives over here. I mean, I tried the parenting plans yeah. and the healthy eating. And it like, doesn't work. Yeah. Like we talk about like nutritious snacks versus junk snacks. But even that is like qualifying food in a way that like becomes evil. And <laughs> well, that's the stuff that's so much pressure as a parent. It's yeah. like, I want to just call it whatever the fuck I call it. But then I heard someone say, you should never say no. You should never say this. You shouldn't <laughs> say, you should never talk about food. You should never talk about their bodies. You should. And it's like, right. you cannot, you would just never say anything. You'd just be like, uh, here's dinner. Which like, is it, pretty much where I've gotten at this point. Yeah. Which is why, of like, I'm just quiet about these issues. Um, my eldest kid was at my mom's house the other day. And she pulled me aside when she came home and she said, I, I have something I need to talk to you about. And I was like, ah, oh, crap. She <laughs> said, I, I saw a photo of you. I didn't like the way oh, you looked. Was it when you were like restricting? No. It was when I was about her age and I was round and oh. in a tap dancing. I mean, it's a fucking hilarious photo <laughs> it's like red white and blue leotard jazzy like white gloves and I was just like a weird looking kid I mean I had buck teeth yeah I was overweight I had frizzy hair I wasn't like the <laughs> most attractive. you at your best right but of course my mom you know every mom's like I love you anyway it has this picture framed so <laughs> uh so then she started sobbing she said that she felt bad like she was hurting my feelings by not liking the way I looked. Holy shit, this is so I layered. Like, I was like, you didn't even have to tell me about it. I wouldn't have known. Yeah. Things would have been great <laughs> if you kept this to yourself, kid. <laughs> but but also like, how messed up is it just like even thinking that I don't like the way someone looks because they're larger bodied? Like she knows it's wrong, right? Yeah. She knows it's wrong to judge someone by the size of their body or the way that they look. But she couldn't help herself from doing it. It was like obviously a just a feeling that she had. 
Well, and it could have been so much more layered. You know what I mean? Sure. It could have been about like, that's maybe what I'm going to look like. That's, well, like, so then I, that's what happened. I yeah. was like trying to get to the bottom of it. And she said, that's how I look. And, and oh. I was like, no, actually, you don't look like that at all. And I, it's okay not to like the way I looked there. And I, I was like, I just started spewing all those like aphorisms yeah. Yeah. that you think you're supposed to say. And she said, I don't like my belly and my thighs touch. And we like started. Like, oh, uh, God, it starts so it's fucking so early. Young. She's eight. And so at that point, yeah, I just started lying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I love how strong my body is. And I love that it can help me do things. And what does your body Appreciate help you do? Appreciate your body. It got you here and where you are. Oh. Totally. And I mean, I'm sure she's like, mom's full of shit. You know, not like, yet, not yet. Maybe soon. Maybe. I don't know. She can see that I get dressed like seven times in the morning before I walk out the door. So, so something's there. Yeah. All right, people, raise your hand if you have ever been personally exhausted by email, right? Same, friend, same. We're all so constantly inundated with email. And if you're like me, going through your inbox becomes less about responding to everything and more about just finding a way to keep tabs on the messages that really matter. You know, like the ones from the school telling me my kids are in trouble that I get all the time. Anyway, that's where SaneBox comes in. Think of it as an EMT for your email. As messages flow in, SaneBox does the triage for you, sifting only the important emails in your inbox and directing all the other distracting stuff, you know what I'm talking about, into your Sane Later folder. So you know what messages you need to pay attention to now and what stuff you can get to like, you know, like eventually after maybe a nap or I don't know, a cocktail. It also, and I, I know I'm waxing poetically, but it has some very handy features like the same black hole where you can drag messages from annoying senders that you never want to hear from again. Bye, friend. Oh, and it also has sane reminders to ping you if someone hasn't replied to your email by a certain date. I mean, nothing like having to follow up on your follow up, am I right? All right, best of all, you can use SaneBox with any email client or phone anywhere you check your email. I mean, come on. See how SaneBox can magically remove distractions from your inbox with a free two-week trial. That's a deal. Visit SaneBox.com slash well today to start your trial, and you're going to get a $25 credit. That's S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash W-E-L-L. Go ahead, folks. Get it. Well... Your honesty is so amazing and it's so helpful because like you and I are not the only people who feel this way. And I thought for many, many years that the answer was to do those platitudes, say those things, say the right things. If I never talk about their weight, if I never, whatever. But the reality is, is like, I can't like when they start to do something, it's my fear. Yeah. Okay. It's my fear of like, so my daughter is just turned 14 yesterday. Oh, my son is about to be 12. And neither of them are like stickly skinny, but they're not like wildly overweight. But I'm I'm watching their sugar intake. I'm like, and and with everything that they do, I'm like, are they gonna become addicts? Are they gonna become this? Are they gonna become so the pressure so <laughs> because it's a train track, right? It's yeah. Like, if it only goes one, in one direction, it only goes in one direction, you can't get off. Yeah. yeah. Only, my family is riddled with alcoholism. It's <laughs> right. only going in one direction. Do I think that they can't? hear me sigh, you know, like they can hear and see all of that. They can feel my fear. Mm. And what I'm trying to do, and it's in all caps, is two things. And I, I want to hear your thoughts about it is one, give up the idea of who they become. And it is, I think, probably the most difficult thing in the whole wide world, because I want to write the past that have happened to me. Totally. Right. Can't happen. Yeah. I can only parent. Right. So I'm trying to do that and be like, well, if they do end up in a program, I will support them. I will love them. I will help them. Like that is all I can do. And then just trying to be really open about my story. Hmm. So my kids do all they know, know everything. Uh, yeah. I wow. mean, we've talked about my parents and drinking. We've since, since they were fairly young 
And I do think that I started off talking about that maybe because I was like, maybe I can scare them with these stories. <laughs> um, like, they're both dead, guys. <laughs> dead. <laughs> it's really good parenting. Um, but I think that it morphed into just an education of like, this is your history and you should be aware of it. And I want you to make the choices that you can make. And we, we started in one direction. We took away all the rules around food. And by the way, that lasted for like six months. It was insanity on stilts because we had started off with this, like you can have three snacks a week. And then it felt like there was all this bartering going on and it was getting negotiating all all the time. time. And they're they're like, wow, this is a birthday. That doesn't count toward the three snacks. And it was just, it just got so crazy that we took the guardrails off. And then we realized, okay, they're too young. We took off two, like, let's put some guardrails back on. So then we signed them up for a nutrition course. And I was like, we're going to give you the information and we're going to talk about what a healthy meal looks like. And then we're going to say, you make your choices. And that's where we are now. And it's mm, sort of, it's in and out. Okay. You know, it's in and out. Like, and so I'll try to be like, no, you guys, you just, all right, look, I know I said that you can make your own choices, but you cannot have Twizzlers. It's, it's nine. Yeah. Like we're just after lunch, you can make that choice. But like right now, like, let's just wait till after lunch for the candy. Um, right. Because I mean, I like that idea and I know personally how addicting sugar is. Oh my God. It's and how so addictive. unformed these kids brains are yet. Right. So like, it's almost like saying, Here's some information. You can make your own decisions, but you're also like under the, it's like but the it's white also, horse also, of sugar. I was going to say, but also here's a pound of cocaine. Right, exactly. Good luck with like, that. Yeah. And it's so fun. And it's it so. It tastes fucking fantastic. It, right. It's rainbows and unicorns. And every birthday party, there's a snack or an option or an opportunity for a treat every five seconds. Always. So, or I, you did good today, which is the worst. Oh, yeah. That's, that's fun. That's a hard Let's go have to, a treat. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> I do it to myself, too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, Steph and I have been talking a lot about how to celebrate in a healthy way. And I only have, like, two ways. Well, yeah. What are, are they? Well, one is the bubble bath, which I've talked about <laughs> a, a nausea. <laughs> and my other one is, like, a walk, like a nature walk. Oh, that's, that's all fun. I've got right now. But like, well, so let's come back yeah. to you. I just think that there's two things here. There's like the, the kids stuff, but then there's like the you stuff. And I think I'm going to challenge the idea that that Kate, who compartmentalized and put it off here and said, like, I think there's a little more work to be done there. And I think I don't think you're going to be able to go a whole life with it in the closet. Ah! I'm just going to say it. I'm <laughs> ripping the Band-Aid off right now. What's so interesting is that I think if we were talking about literally anything else, because we've had so many of these conversations, never about this topic, but the idea that of like pushing down <laughs> any amount of self-hatred and just sort of like storing it over here and focusing over here, the advice is never like, oh yeah, you can do that. Keep doing that. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> but for some reason, I think because we're all like close to this, it feels like, okay, well, there's no help, you know, or, yeah. or so like there's like a darker. Well, it was a success. It worked for her for a it minute. It worked. Yeah. But then sometimes your solves stop working. Well, mm. and what's interesting, I think with kids, I do not have kids. I have never parented anything other than myself. <laughs> Some plans. And you're doing a great Very job. Well. You're, doing so good stuff. you're doing so good. Thank you. Um, but like, I remember being a kid and I remember my parents would tell me things and I would be like, okay, but you're telling me that, but you're acting different. Yeah. I think that could be potentially more traumatizing to a child uh, than actually 100%. putting some of the fear in them of like, this is a shitty quality about me and I don't love it, but it comes out every once in a while, you know, because it sort of distorts your memory as your of your parent, you know, and it makes you like not trust your parent. And I think that's what's interesting about the like giving them the meal plan or whatever. You're like, look, I'm not sure I'm the best person to give you this this advice yeah. and because I maybe have problems over here but like here's some here's some things that you can learn and then their trust and love and respect for you is still maintained in a weird way yeah I think I'm finally getting to the point where I do realize I can't not talk about it anymore yeah. um I I'm afraid that it means I have to turn into some like body positive person that is not who I am. (laughs) No, but that's the lie is I think right now you're almost overcompensating by being like, I love my body and like blah, 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 (laughs) where it's like your kid is probably like, is this what loving your body looks like? You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas if you were like, yeah, you know, 
I don't love my body all the time, but I try to focus on the things that my body does well for me, like digest food. And I love that I can go on long walks. Yeah. Yeah. Not so much right now because I have a broken ankle, but. (laughs) But I think, I think that what you're saying is a really good point, Steph. And I think that the idea that you're going to just like the success is that you'll love your body. Mm. Those of us who have not liked our body for many, 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 many years, that is not going to be an encouragement. It's just not. Well, it feels impossible. It, yeah. And I, so I think like, fuck it, just move that over there. Put that in the closet. This idea that you're going to love your body. Let's just deal with that later. You got to just start right at the trauma of just um, what do you need to support you and to start to, like, I go to OA, to Readers Anonymous, and I do mostly just like call in meetings when I do, and I know I need to be on a food plan. And like during COVID, I was not, and I was more angry. I was more, and Starting, I don't know, maybe the top of the year, I got back on my food plan and I try not to approach it about losing weight. Of course I do. I can't not think that way, but I am just approaching it about being on my food plan. But here's the reason I'm saying this. We went on vacation last week and it was the very, very first time in my life that I remained on a food plan during a vacation ever. Like I just have never been able to do it. And it was like, I was, I'm not even gonna try to lie. I was white knuckling some moments. Like there were some moments where I was like, I don't need that bread. It was like, (laughs) I was like, this is not good for me. It was like, you know, but I was like, I had planned for it all. I had gone into it knowing it was going to be an all inclusive and that I love rum punch and I was going to like have my thing. And I brought an exercise and activity. But my whole point of sharing all this is that my son He'd be like, well, why, why can't you have this cake? Like they had birthday cake last night and I didn't have any. She, he was, and I said, I just can't. I said, when I have that cake, I will then want 47 more cakes. It's just, that's the way it works for me. And I'm really honest about it. And so I just try to talk to him about him in particular, because I think he's like me. Um, so I try to talk about like, all right, well, I'm looking at my meal holistically. Half my plate's a salad, so I'm going to look for a protein, and then I'm going to have a carb. And on the vacation, he was like, he was like, well, what's that? And I was like, well, I'm eating an egg white omelet. And he said, that's interesting. He said, what's in it? And I said, it's uh, peppers, onions, whatever, you know. And he's like, I'm going to go try one. And and he came back, and he was like, this, oh, this isn't bad. He said, I think I prefer the regular eggs. And I said, okay. And he said, but that's a better choice, right? And I said, that is a better choice than five muffins. For sure. I said, but you could do this. You're on vacation and then you could have a muffin. So we're having conversations about how to be holistic about his plate or his meal or his day or his week. And I don't know if that's the right thing to do. I don't. I don't know if I ever will. But I know that for all of COVID, I don't know, I put on 20 pounds. They saw they saw how I ate. They saw how I was. They saw my behavior. So like The only thing I know to do is just, I just got to fucking be honest. Okay. I want to be honest. All right, people, raise your hand if you have ever been personally exhausted by email, right? Same, friend, same. We're all so constantly inundated with email. And if you're like me, going through your inbox becomes less about responding to everything and more about just finding a way to keep tabs on the messages that really matter, you know, like the ones from the school telling me my kids are in trouble that I get all the time. Anyway, that's where SaneBox comes in. Think of it as an EMT for your email. As messages flow in, SaneBox does the triage for you, sifting only the important emails in your inbox and directing all the other distracting stuff, you know what I'm talking about, into your Sane Later folder. So you know what messages you need to pay attention to now and what stuff you can get to like, you know, like eventually after maybe a nap or I don't know, a cocktail. It also, and I I know I'm waxing poetically, but it has some very handy features like the same black hole where you can drag messages from annoying senders that you never want to hear from again. Bye, friend. Oh, and it also has sane reminders to ping you if someone hasn't replied to your email by a certain date. I mean, nothing like having to follow up on your follow-up, am I right? All right, best of all, you can use SaneBox with any email client or phone anywhere you check your email. I mean, come on. See how SaneBox can magically remove distractions from your inbox with a free two-week trial. That's a deal. 
Visit SaneBox.com slash well today to start your trial, and you're going to get a $25 credit. That's S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash W-E-L-L. Go ahead, folks. Get it. If you were honest, what's the thing you would say to them? <laughs> I Well, I've, I've said a version of this before, but I would say... There's something in my brain that makes me not like the way I look. That's always telling me that I look different than how other people see me. And it's like a broken part of my brain. I can't fix it. Well, I shouldn't say that. But yeah. that's what I do say. Yeah. <laughs> um, what if you just showed them the definition of body dysmorphia and started to talk about it in clinical terms. And then what if you were willing to say, and here's what I'm going to do about it? That's the piece that's missing yeah. is if you give them this without any hope, then you're just telling them I'm broken. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But if they see you working on it, like, what do you want to give them? I'm making assumptions. But yeah. I have to assume that you don't love that you feel this way. That's a great assumption. I don't. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. A plus. So wouldn't it be amazing if they saw you working on that to whatever end it becomes? Yes. And I am only in the last few months, I think, realizing that I have to actually work on it. Yeah. That I actually have to address these things. And for so long, it's been so part of my personality that... I almost feel like I'm not going to be who I am. Who are you without it? Yeah. Um, maybe you'd just be funny, like well, hysterical, but not making fun of yourself. Maybe. I'd have to learn some new jokes. I bet you could find them. <laughs> funny people find content. <laughs> oh. And so I want that. And I especially want that because I'm also pushing myself, my daughters, my husband, everybody around me who has things they want to change, I'm pushing them to change those things and saying, I can't change myself, but you guys, you should really but do you it. you got this. Here's yeah. a therapist number. Here's a exactly. Right. I'm in therapy. I'm not going to talk about it, but you should. Um, <laughs> so I realize how hypocritical that is. It certainly helps that I have like two very smart kids who are constantly calling me out on things. Isn't that um, fun? So fun. I'm like, <laughs> I told one of them the other day, I was like, don't you talk back to me. And she goes, if I don't talk back, how are you going to hear what I have to say? <laughs> and I was like, well, fuck. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> so it's like, I know, I know that they're smart. I know that they can handle it. I wonder if I can handle it. Well, you're only going to know what's inside if you start talking about it with them. Yeah. But if you're trying to give them a sanitized version of reality, and I, I'm saying this, you give it to them in age appropriate, you know, language, you know, you're not like, you know, giving them heroin addiction stories in an alley. <laughs> but like, I do think, you know, the way I started talking about my mom, I've aged it up over the years. You know, we started talking and I just said she, she drank a lot and she wasn't healthy. And because of that, she didn't take care of her body and she didn't, she didn't make it. And then we started talking in more detail and then they had questions and I, and I answer everything. I let them lead and I answer it. And I know it's not my journey. And it's horrifically hard to let them go on their own journey. Yeah. When you said that earlier, I was like, oh, God, what do you it's mean awful. give up who they're going to be? <laughs> I have a note on that because you said something like, um, you know, I have to let go of who they're going to become, which is so, so hard. Then I two seconds because later say, but I want them to be. Yeah. <laughs> you said because I'm trying to write my past. Yeah. yeah. Yep. But that. Yeah is something that I'm hearing a lot in this. Like, that's your past. Exactly. Like, exactly. it's not their past. I'm projecting the crap out of, oh, yeah. of my past on them. Yeah, and your present is more, like, how you show up every day is more important than whatever you went through before, I think. No, you're absolutely um, right. And I think there's also this thread that we, like, keep talking about. There's, like, this idea of perfection. Like, you have to be perfect on your meal plan or you have to be perfect at the gym or like you have to look perfect in your outfit and like if one little thing goes wrong it's like well what's the point 
Oh, you know, yeah. it's like, wait, take that to the next level. I have to be the perfect parent. Yeah. I have to do it exactly right. I have to teach them this exactly perfectly. And that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm realizing I cannot do. It does not work. There is no, there, there isn't, isn't that. It yeah. doesn't exist. And I think but that's. But striving for it is stupid and it isn't helpful. Exactly. And it's exhausting. Exhausting. Yeah. Because you're like constantly telling yourself that wasn't good. That sucked. You're like going through your brain at the end I of the night. I didn't do this. So I could have done that better. Yeah. I'm a terrible like, parent. Finding the middle ground for yourself. You know, you don't have to be body positive. Like that's the perfect version of you. Yeah. You know, that's not realistic. I don't think yeah. like what might be realistic, though, is maybe like you're like, hell yeah, I look good today once a month. Yeah. Seems like we've been told forever that the fix to issues with weight or body or self-image is to love your body. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the only fix. Right. And I just don't, I don't buy that. I don't know. Like maybe I'm not going to ever get there, but I couldn't get to, um, I respect my body. And sometimes this is what I will say. I'll be like, I'm so thankful that you are still here after all the shit I did to you. Like, cause, cause yeah. it's like, I mean, I've gained and lost 60 pounds multiple times. Like, it's like, that is so mean and so hard <laughs> so to my body. So confusing for your yeah. body. You know, that's hard. Yeah. And so I can thank my body for putting up with me, with my crazy brain. Yeah. So there's things that can be done that aren't that. But I do think it's a two-tier path. It's got to be work over here and then rigorous honesty with your kids. I do want to also say that I think there's an amount that you can restructure your brain in positive talk you know yes there's like a difference between like looking in the mirror and being like I'm beautiful I love my body <laughs> versus like every day being like okay what's something nice I can say about myself and trying to like yeah. integrate that into your life objectively if you walk out of the house every morning and you've already said to yourself 400 times before you walk out the door like I'm ugly and I hate myself oh. and whatever like all of the mean things that we're saying to ourselves of course taking time to say one nice thing about yourself will change your day. Like it will make your day a little bit better. It doesn't have to be the perfect day, but it can be like a slightly nicer day. So I've been trying that. <laughs> I have an app for that. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, I, I'm like, I'm trying to build certain habits, right? Like I want to write for 10 minutes a day. I want to do all these things. Um, one of the things that I'm supposed to do every day is um, say one nice thing about yourself I, I wish everyone could see how anxious she is right now. <laughs> like hands are. I have not been able to check that box. All right. Well, you know that we're going to make you say one nice thing about yourself right now so you can check the box today. I, we're yeah. Gonna, we're going to close our eyes and look the other way, Steph. You're in the room alone. <laughs> one nice thing about yourself. Steph's trying to get her out of it. <laughs> um, one nice thing about myself. You could do it. Jesus. Um, I, what, see, I can <laughs> – what I can do is I know I can say one nice thing about myself and, like, I was really kind to my daughter this morning or I, you know, made my bed. But that's not the shit I have problems with. Right. Right? So – But does that extend to I'm a kind person and I'm dedicated to my home? Um, I guess it could extend that way. I would never go as far as to say that about myself, though. <laughs> well, Isn't I, that fucked up? I, I feel like I don't want to put you two on the spot right yeah. now, but I do want you to, at some point before this episode airs, record one nice thing about yourself and we'll put it at the end of the episode okay. in the area that you're uncomfortable with, something that makes you uncomfortable to say out loud. Okay. I also think not liking oneself actually holds that one, me, holds mm. me back from other successes from so many things yeah like not just like the feel-good stuff of like having good relationships with my like partner or my family but also I am certain I would have had a more successful career I would have been farther along on my career path if I like actually liked me because it, when you walk into every conversation and every disparaging yourself yeah yeah that's actually not attractive to other people well it's also just like people who take up more space people who say um you should believe in me people yeah. go oh i should believe in them they, they look at, all right okay and they don't even know they're doing it but they're just like all right i'll listen yeah you know it's there's that but what if we even took that point and made it simpler 
if every morning you weren't trying on seven outfits and, you know, berating yourself, there's no way you're present to your kids or to your partner during that time because you are too busy looking in the mirror telling yourself you look horrible. Yeah. I could be doing something fun for myself. Right. You could be being connected with your kids. You could be, you know, talking to your husband about what you're going to do later. You could be like, there's a million things you could be doing. Yeah. You'd be taking a bath with lights. <laughs> yeah. One of I could my be two writing things. by 10 minutes a day. I could yeah. Be, yeah. That's one of the things that I know is that when I am in the food, I am not present mm-hmm. because I could be talking to you and thinking like, after this, I think I'm going to sneak out. I'm going to try to go to the deli. And then like and that whole conversation is happening while you're talking. And I can make it look like I'm listening. I'm not listening. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm listening, but I'm not really with you. Right. What's at stake I mean, and I don't, I know you know how serious this is, so I don't mean this to come out this way, but like what's at stake is everything for you. Yeah. What's at stake is your connection to your kids, is your connection to yourself, is your connection to being present in this world. Aren't you worth that? Like working on this and having these honest conversations with your kids? You are. You're a powerful and fantastic lady. There's huge stakes right here. I think maybe that's the takeaway is like instead of looking at it as just like food and eating and bringing things to your children in the right way, it's like holistic. Okay, well, what am I doing? How am I showing up for myself and for my family and for the relationships that are important and like loving myself? And if you can't give that to yourself in words of affirmation, maybe you're doing it in other ways that are holistically approaching your life, your self-love. Yeah, I think... um There's also perhaps an opportunity to change. Like, yes, it's about me, but I also think, I don't know, people who have like these kinds of like either body dysmorphia or even OCD and like control things, um, sometimes having an external reason is more motivating. So, In my mind, if I think about like breaking a cycle that has lived for generations, like isn't that worth it? Yeah. Right. Even if maybe I'm not. Even if it's just a little bit better. But if I can see it externally first, sometimes that helps. Yeah. To me, that's like motivating, but it's also like a lot of pressure because then, like, what if you don't break it? Did you fail then? No. Because you made it Obviously. better. You made it better. Right. So like making the generational one trauma generational trauma better. a little less. Yeah. Once like if I do Shipping if my kids are away. a little bit better than I was, then I won. Yes. Yeah. I do have to say, I think the funniest thing about this entire episode <laughs> is that Steph brought muffins and and, no and that they and that they've been sitting on the table the entire time I will we take record. Them with me. And I think that's hilarious. Well, I I will also say I have been looking at them the entire time <laughs> they've been there. <laughs> And, like, considering if I will be having one or not. And, like, how exhausting is that, right? That's, that's just exactly it. it. That's, and I think that's a motivator is to have some of that space back in your brain. Yeah. I can say one nice thing about myself. You can? You can say it right now? Go. I can say one nice thing about myself. This is a great way to end. I really like the color of my eyes. Oh. Oh. Let's All see right. them. They're, like, greenish blue. Oh, yeah. They're beautiful. Thank you. Gorge. Also love Thanks. your glasses. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I, the eyes can't see very well, but man, they're pretty. <laughs> see, there we go again. So you did it. <laughs> All right. I love it. I've, our, our work here is done. Okay. Yeah, perfect. I think we solved it. We, we fixed it. Yeah. Robin, do you know your shirt says fat? Oh, yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> it says fat ass. It's my sister, it's a winery. My sister sends it to me, and I think it's the funniest oh teacher God. ever. This is a subliminal episode. I'm literally looking, and I'm like, that can't say fat. Does that say fat? <laughs> It certainly does. Oh, because it's a donkey. Way, it's fat a donkey, ass. so fat ass. And it's a winery. But, but by the way, this would be a great moment to cut to a commercial for a yeah, fat ass winery. Fat ass winery. <laughs> Hit us up. Hit us up. <laughs> you have reached the well adjusting expert of the day. Hey, friends. My name is Rosie Acosta. I'm a mindfulness and meditation teacher at Headspace and author of the book, You Are Radically Loved, A Healing Journey to Self-Love. I also have a podcast (laughs) called The Radically Loved Podcast. So many things. I feel like a lot of the times we have this misconception that with this self-love movement that we have to all of a sudden just love exactly what we are as we are. And I'm not a fan of that. It's taken me such a long time 
to cultivate a true, compassionate, loving relationship with my body, with myself. And one of the things that I love about what I do for a living is that I can actually speak from experience. I struggled with an eating disorder in my 20s and I had a really tenuous relationship with my body at best. My body was just a vessel and it took a long time for me to get to this place of appreciating what I had, even though, yes, there are still those moments where I feel like my body is the enemy as things start to change. It's an ever evolving practice. I think there are many tools. First, obviously practicing being present, allowing yourself to immerse yourself in the experience and the here and the now to know that we are safe, to appreciate our body, to appreciate the fact that we can breathe, to appreciate the fact that we can take ourselves from point A to point B, to really think about the things that we love the most. I mean, for some people, it's like, I love my toes <laughs> or I love that I can speak, that I can hear, that I can move about the world. This body has taken us through a plethora of experiences. And so when we take a moment to practice the second thing, gratitude, when we can really appreciate just those little things, it goes a long way. When I got into mindfulness and meditation and yoga, I started to create a better relationship. And it wasn't like I accepted myself the next day, but it took some time for me to really appreciate, to be present, to breathe, to say, okay, maybe this isn't how I want to feel, but it's what I have right now. How can I make the best of it? So I really think that taking those experiences and building on that, right? Because we've built on the negative pathway for a long time, right? When you look in the mirror, it's like, what is the first thing that you say? Do you look in the mirror and say, wow, like, this is amazing. You look great today. Or look at you, well rested. We don't do that most often. Most often it's the, Ugh, or oh, got wrinkles, or I need to moisturize my skin, whatever it is negative pathway that's taken a long time to build. So how do we habituate ourselves to a more loving, compassionate, more connected pathway? We have to start little by little. The moment that you look in the mirror and you feel that impulse or that reaction of negativity, just turn it right around. Just turn it right around. Allow yourself to have that moment. Yes, absolutely. But also take that time, take that opportunity to say, and I'm grateful for X, Y, and Z. The last thing that I will say is self-compassion. Now, this is a really big practice for me to give myself the space to have whatever experience I'm having and not judge it. Don't judge yourself. Allow yourself to have whatever experience you're having and know that in order to create sustainable change, you need to allow yourself to just take it one beat at a time, one turnaround of a comment at a time, one breath at a time. All right, everybody, that is it for today. Just a humongous thanks to Kate for being so brave and open and talking about this really, really important topic. And of course, thank you to Rosie Acosta for sharing her calm and cool and collected wisdom. And I am telling you, go check out Rosie's podcast, Radical Love, or her book, You Are Radically Loved. You will not regret it. For more Robin, and you may need that, you probably don't need it, but like if you do, you can follow me at Real Rob Hops on all the platforms, all the socials, as the kids today say. Well Adjusting is an edit audio original, exec produced by Steph Colburn and Robin Hopkins. 
Thank you to Maria Passingham, Kathleen Speckert, and the whole Edit Audio team. Oh, hey, before you take out those AirPods, this show is just for entertainment. If you are in need of help, please, please, please reach out to a professional. Go ahead and get that help. You deserve it. The McNugget Buddies are back. But this time, they got a fresh look as part of the new Kerwin Frost Box at McDonald's. We're talking all new buddies, dressed head to toe in the freshest fits, all designed by the artist Kerwin Frost. So when you order the Kerwin Frost Box with your choice of 10-piece McNuggets or a Big Mac, you'll get one of the flyest McNugget Buddies to go with it. Think you can collect them all? Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. I'm loving it. At participating McDonald's for a limited time, while supplies last. 